Our next presenter is Aaron Emmy. Aaron is a graduate student at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. And Aaron's uh, mentor this summer was Alma Hotsik. And her topic for her oral presentation is the effect of a changing climate on primary and secondary organic aerosols in the Arctic. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Erin Emmy. I'm with the University of Illinois and a second year PhD student. And this summer I was with the Nessie internship at ACOM. And today I will be presenting my project, The Effect of a Changing Climate on Primary and Secondary Organic Aerosols in the Arctic. So first, I'd just like to start off with a brief background. There are primary organic aerosols, or POA, which are emitted directly from an anthropogenic source. This could be something like a power plant. And there are secondary organic aerosols, or SOA, which are a bit more complex. They are produced by the atmospheric transformation or oxidation of organic precursor species, such as VOCs. And this oxidation can happen within several generations of the precursor. SOA formation is dependent on uh, atmospheric conditions such as temperature, relative humidity, NOx, and more. Additionally, emissions from biogenic sources such as forests and plants are dependent on temperature. So organic aerosols are a large uh, fraction of aerosol mass in the Arctic, yet there's little understanding due to limited observational data and difficulty modeling. It's important to study organic aerosols in the Arctic because better representing their processes, sources, and composition will help us improve the understanding of aerosol direct and indirect radiative effects, which can affect the local climate. In the Arctic, SOA is more important during the summertime due to the dependence on light for photochemistry. And this is evident in the plots shown here, where SOA is much more concentrated in the summertime than in the wintertime down here. Additionally, sources of OA in this region range from uh, transported anthropogenic pollution to biogenic emissions and even local emissions. And the plot shown down here is a back trajectory and it was performed from the Arctic and as you can see in these tiny little hot spots that SOA is actually originating here. So places like Eurasia and East Central Europe and other places like Russia and Siberia are important for this. So for this study, we used observational data from a paper published in Nature by Moschos et al. These observations were taken at sites in the Arctic shown in the map on this slide. And these locations were chosen to represent the entire Arctic. As you can see, they're pretty spread out there. And the table on this slide also just shows some more information about where these sites are located. So the objective of this study was to first evaluate CSM predictions of organic aerosols over the Arctic and investigate how climate change may impact SOA formation and composition for present 2050 and 2100 conditions in polar regions. The Arctic is a really interesting place to study this because temperature rise is expected to be much more intense in this region. I used data from the Community Earth System Model, or CESM, at one degree resolution. And this data is a multi-year average, average for the present, which is 20, 2005 to 2014, and the future, which is 2045 to 2054, and 2091 to 2100. And this future data is based off of the conditions outlined in the IPCC shared socioeconomic pathways. And these are shown in the table on this slide. They range from best to worst case scenario, and their likely long-term temperature increases are also included. This is global temperature increase. So first, I'm gonna talk about uh, comparing observations to the model, CSM, as I mentioned, and we're gonna look at SSP2 4.5 conditions, which is the middle of the road scenario. So first on these uh, plots, I'm showing the kind of left side of the map, so only four sites first. And for POA on the top here, when comparing the first two panels for observation and the model in the present, you can see that the observations do not match the model. There's a slight overprediction. And for SOA, you can see that there values here are underpredicted by the model. In the future, POA is expected to decrease by the end of the century, and for SOA, values stay relatively high. There's pretty little change there. And for the other four sites, you can see that for POA, it's a little bit different. Site B is a pretty fair prediction. Site P and Z is a slight over prediction. And site T is a pretty massive uh, under prediction. This could be due to biogenic or wildfire emissions that CSM just isn't catching. And you can see the same trend here for the future. Uh, values are predicted to decrease by the end of the century. 
For SOA, we see a general underprediction by the model. And in the end of the century, there's little change again. It's important to note that there is an incorrect ratio between POA and SOA. There's too much POA in the model and too little SOA. So this suggests that CSM is missing some chemistry for SOA formation. Next, I looked how SOA is predicted to um, be in the future. So this first plot shows SOA in the present, 2050 and 2090 for that same scenario, SSP2 4.5. There's an increase pretty significantly by the end of the century, specifically at sites T and P. And we wanted to know why this was happening, so we looked at NOx conditions and saw that NOx is projected to decrease by the end of the century. NOx can contribute to OH concentrations in the atmosphere, which has to do with, with those reactions forming aerosol, so this is significant for SOA formation. We also looked at biogenic emissions, specifically isoprene shown here at the bottom. And you can see that isoprene is also projected to increase at these two sites. And these two sites are actually located near foresty areas, so it makes sense that there are gonna be a lot more biogenic emissions here. And biogenic emissions act as precursors for SOA formation, so this definitely could be contributing to that uh, rise in SOA concentrations. I also looked at Arctic temperature ranges at each of the sites extracted from CSM. For the sake of time, I'm just gonna look at two sites. So as you can see here for site P, temperatures are expected to increase throughout the year. And you can see the same thing for site T. Overall, temperatures are expected to increase about five to 20 degrees Celsius, depending on the location and the time of year. And this is, to put it into perspective for us Americans, uh, nine to 36 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's a pretty large increase. Switching gears a bit, we use the Generator of Explicit Chemistry and Kinetics of Organics in the Atmosphere, or GECOA, to kind of play with how temperature affects SOA formation. And we chose to use GECOA because it's a full chemistry mechanism, compared to CSM, which has pretty simplified chemistry. There's only about 10 species in there. So GECOA is a box model, and it's good for idealized simulations, meaning that it's not necessarily representative of everything that's going on in the atmosphere. So the table here shows four different scenarios and their respective NOx conditions. These range from low NOx to high NOx, and this allowed us to play with the sensitivity of SOA formation on NOx as well. The rest of the, the, rest of the conditions in the table were held constant in the model. I chose three different precursors to simulate within GECOA, dodecane, toluene, and alpha-pinene. And these three per precursors were chosen because they have relatively different structures, so we were able to really see the effect of temperature on some different species. So for the simulations, we performed each scenario and each precursor at the temperature range shown here, which was again extracted from that Arctic temperature range I showed previously. And here are the results. When we were performing our simulations, we were really interested in looking at the SOA yield, which is the amount of SOA produced per precursor. So for example, if there's a 15% SOA yield, that means once 100% of the precursor has been consumed, 15% has been converted to SOA, while the rest is in the gas phase or has been degraded. So as you can see here, the, tr the um, trend is that with increasing temperature, we get decreasing SOA yield. It's pretty clear that uh, SOA formation is pretty, uh, pretty sensitive to changes in temperature. There's up to about a 20% change with only a 10 degree increase. Switching over to the plot over here, we looked at the Odyssey aerosol ratio to kind of explain what was happening with that SOA yield. And the Odyssey aerosol ratio is the amount of oxygen in the aerosol phase compared to carbon. The trend you can see here is that with increasing temperature, you get increasing Odyssey ratio. And this makes sense because SOA yield is higher at colder temperatures, meaning that more aerosol is being made due to its ability to condense with less chemistry or less oxidation than higher temperatures. Also, less oxidation forming the aerosol suggests a lower Odyssey ratio because there's less oxygen attaching to that aerosol. And a higher O2C ratio also suggests that more chemical processing has taken place, which happens at higher temperatures. These plots are for the remote continental scenario, which is lower NOx conditions. I plotted the polluted continental scenario here. And you can see the same trend happening here, except the SOA values are a bit higher. And this makes sense because as I mentioned previously, NOx has a huge impact on SOA formation. 
You also might notice that SOA yield is larger than 100% and that is possible because oxygen atoms are actually attaching to that carbon skeleton, making the molecule grow larger. So an important thing to note is that SOA concentrations will be very difficult to regulate in the future. There are so many different atmospheric conditions that play a role in SOA formation. Here we looked at temperature and a little bit of NOx, but relative humidity, light, and other conditions really play a factor in this. There are also millions of different reactions and species that have to be accounted for, so obviously it's just it's not a straightforward process and a lot of work has to be done. So in conclusion, like I said, SOA formation is really complex and not straightforward. Uh, we looked at CSM and found that it does not predict SOA and POA concentrations in the Arctic well. This was kind of the first time someone looked at this in this region, so it was a really important thing to pick up on. Also, temperature has a significant impact on SOA formation and composition. There was up to a 20% change in SOA yield with only a 10 degree increase. And preliminary runs uh, showed that there is a slight dependent of SOA formation on relative humidity, but it's less than that of the impact of temperature. And if you want to talk to me more about that, I'll be at the poster session. <laughs> um, next steps include running a realistic simulation at a couple of the Arctic sites using Gecko A, and we're going to initialize that with CSM present and future data. And we'd also like to perform back trajectories from a couple of these sites and simulate SOA formation along these paths. I'd like to thank NCAR for the summer and specifically my mentor, Alma. I've learned so much and just thank you so much. I'd love to take questions. Questions from the audience? Thank you, Aaron, it's great. Um, my question is, at the beginning when you show the observation of SOA and POA, you see the sort of the error bar for SOAs or the one before this, because it's much larger than the POA. I wonder, um, I don't know, the techniques for observation for different aerosols. Yeah, so these, were, these observations were taken using an aerosol mass spectrometer. Um, so, I mean, I don't, I don't know why the error bar is necessarily much larger than POA, but it is, I mean, it's difficult to kind of, you know, look at SOA compared to POA because those are direct emissions. So that could play a factor in it for sure. Cool. I have another question is uh, later on you show the, uh, with temperature increase, the o, o to C ratio, you know, increase something, but you see the blue one has a plateau. Do you have an explanation for that? Um, I mean, this is the model, you know, so it's not going to be perfect. Um, I'm not, I'm, I don't know if there's necessarily a reason that there's a plateau there. The only thing that I could think of is that, uh, I mean, this is Kelvin, so it's a little different for us, but you, I think the plateau kind of happens after freezing point. So this could be play a factor in the freezing point really making a big difference. I'm not, that would be my best guess. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Aaron. So along with the three chemicals that you chose, which I will not try to repeat because I don't think I'll say them correctly, <laughs> were there any others that you think you would look at moving forward in the future within your project? Oh yeah, I mean, there's so many different species. We were thinking about looking at xylene. Um, I don't know if we talked about specific ones, but there are definitely a ton of different species that we could run this for. Maybe for like additional question, is there like a target like species that you would be looking at because they have a certain property or is it like? Mm, I don't think necessarily. You might choose things that are more um, anthropogenically sourced versus naturally sourced. That could be something interesting to look at. Um, it's really hard to get the biogenic emissions like like there's PBOA, which is pro like direct emissions of biogenics, which aren't included. So it's a little difficult, but. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just gonna check online. No questions there. Kind of quiet on there today <laughs> on the Slido. Uh, any other audience questions? Yeah. <laughs> All right. 
Um, I don't know how applicable this would be because I know the Antarctic is very different from the Arctic, but would you think that this research could also be looked at in the Southern Hemisphere in that portion of the world as well? Um, it could be. It's difficult because the Antarctic is so far away from any landmass, so I'm not really sure how much long-range pollution would be happening because aerosols have a really short lifetime. Um, I mean, the gases could be transported, but it's a little bit different, especially like you're probably not going to be seeing those primary emissions because those will just drop right out. But yeah. So you used uh, CESM. Were you, was there any other models that you considered using to do this and or like on en ensembles? So there's kind of a newer-ish not really new, but there's a mu model called Musica that has really high resolution over like a defined region. So I think it would be really interesting to compare that model to observations to see if that does any better than CSM. So that's one that we could look at for sure. Is, is there a reason that C CSM is the global circulation model that you're using? Or are there any other models that do the atmospheric chemistry? Oh, I mean, there are a ton of models that do atmospheric chemistry. Uh, there was a postdoc in ACOM that had just done a study on uh, organic aerosols um, and did a lot of stuff on CSM, and we kind of used his data, and it ended up working out really nicely. But there are a ton of different models you could look at for sure. Very cool. Thank you. Oh, you said the, the resolution was one degree, right? Yes. So would you ever, con I, you said that the most, the other one, the Musica? Yeah. That's a higher resolution? What's the resolution on that? Um, I'm not, Alma, what's the resolution on Musica? <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that might be. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron.